Jung and the Story of Our Time by Warrens Vanderpost Prologue I have, I believe, known many of those the world considered great, but Carl Gustav Jung is almost the only one of whose greatness I am certain. Time is relative in more dimensions than those of the continuum where an Einstein's formidable equation places it. It has a knack of putting the truly great, as it were, well ahead of us, rather than in the past darkening so fast behind. As a result, most of those regarded as great in their own lifetime diminish once dead, and only the truly great increase in stature. And this increase in stature precisely is what has happened to Jung, although he died only 14 years ago. Today, he looms larger on the scene of the human spirit than he did in his own lifetime. The books in which he recorded his quintessential self and work are more and more to be found in the pockets of the intellectual young. Words that he introduced in new senses into the modern English idiom have lost their elitism and are part today of our ordinary educated vocabulary. Terms like extrovert, introvert, persona, archetype, anima, animus, and shadow that we owe him testify how wide and deep his impact has been. But what this greatness consists of is almost impossible to define. I myself cannot attempt to do as a specialist of any kind. Even if I could, I do not believe I would. I am not a psychologist. I was never a patient either of Jung or of any of his distinguished collaborators, or for that matter, of any other psychiatrist. I cannot even claim to be a Jungian in the only sense in which I believe he would have approved the term. That is, in regard to someone who has practiced or taught the analytical psychology he pioneered. Used in any larger way, and in particular as a label of discipleship, I know he rejected it and voiced his objections to its use to me on several occasions in those plainest of terms of which he was a master. He did not like the idea of having disciples or blind followers, or even a school, and in his old age agreed most reluctantly to the establishment of the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich for studies relevant to his own approach to psychology. Indeed, I remember him telling me that the Institute would be lucky if it did not outlive its creative uses within a generation. Above all, he had a profound horror of, quote, isms, and the adjective Jungian, which could so easily be a doorstep to Jungianism, was ruled out in his own disi discipline of psychology. Quote, I do not want anybody to be a Jungian, he told me. I want people above all to be themselves. As for isms, they are the viruses of our day and responsible for greater disasters than any medieval plague or pest has ever been. Should I be found one day only to have created another ism, then I would have failed in all I tried to do. Ours was, to use the term in its technical sense, a non-psychological relationship. I was in it purely for the love of it. Insofar as I could make some small return for the immense amount his friendship gave me, I believe it came out of this so that no matter how much my lack of specialist qualifications may limit my interpretation of the man, it is just possible that my view may have a value which is not adequately represented in the mass of material that has been written about him. At the moment, the world knows him almost exclusively as a psychologist and psychiatrist. Yet great and original as his contribution in these fields has been, and unsurpassed as was his gift of healing the abnormal and psychologically sick, his importance to so-called normal man and his societies, I believe, is much greater. It is astonishing to me how this larger aspect of the man has been overlooked by most of the interpreters, who still come from far and wide, like multitude of dingies with outboard motors chugging in the wake of a dreadnought, home at last from a sea on which few of us have ventured. Part of the explanation is that almost all the authors of this formidable intermediary activity have been psychiatrists themselves, 
or started out as patients either of Jung or one of his collaborators. Such an approach, of course, is perfectly valid, of great importance, and should not be underestimated. It would be wrong not to recognize Jung for the inspired psychologist and born healer he was. After all, he started out his career as a pioneer of psychiatry. Psychology and this applied field of it were his medium and led him first to the discovery and subsequently to the exploration of a new world within the human spirit greater and in my view far more significant for life on earth than the world Columbus discovered in the world without. Yet psychology and psychiatry were only a way and not an end in themselves. Had the middlemen between him and the public not all been so preoccupied with their psychiatry, the salient aspect of the man and his work would not have been neglected for so long, and it would not still be possible for another of those books of instant Jung, which are increasingly in favor in the Anglo-Saxon world, to appear, as one did not long ago, with the final chapter headed Jung's contribution to psychiatry, as if that were both the summit and end of his seeking. One has only to glance at Jung's memories, dreams, reflections, to see how the man himself was full and overflowing with a greater concern. There one finds only one chapter, the fourth, entitled Psychiatric Activities. It is followed by one called Sigmund Freud. Then there comes Confrontation with the Unconscious, where, much condensed, Jung gives his own account of a confrontation as portentous for the increase of human awareness as the dark night of exile in the Old Testament, wherein Jacob, the father of Joseph the dreamer, wrestled alone and long with an angel. Only then does one reach the chapter headed, The Work. Understandable as the psychiatric concentration on Jung has been up to this point, it becomes less so subsequently insofar as it persists in presenting this, quote, work of Jung, also as a mere extension of psychology and psychiatry, leaving the popular concept of Jung confined to what remains, despite the resultant enlargement, still a clinical cell. Having never been in such a cell myself, I see it differently and, I believe, in the direction Jung himself viewed it, and I may therefore perhaps help in a small way toward another perspective of him. Even so, I cannot do this in terms of pure knowledge or as a product of any profound research, nor as part of a particular discipline. I can only present it in the way it had meaning for me, and that was as a living experience in the context of a personal relationship in which I had no professional or private acts to grind. Moreover, since I came to the experience reluctantly, I believe that the difficulties from which it stemmed in themselves are a microcosm of the macrocosm of the problem Jung had in making himself and his work understood, and accordingly the problem his own time had in understanding him. I am compelled, therefore, to begin with myself, not for any egotistical purpose, but as the only way open to me if I am to render account of the man and his work as experience and an act of knowledge rather than another one of those abstracts of knowledge already so amply available. Also, I believe that by relating my own long-sustained imperviousness to Jung, I might help to expose in others the same process of negation which, although diminishing, is still astoundingly active in the cultural environment of an hour so much later in the life of our time than we yet care to admit. Finally, the European context of my life in the interior of South Africa and its extreme Calvinistic mold, owing to its remoteness from the swiftly changing Europe of its origin, when communications were far slower and more difficult than today, tended to be so far behind the accelerating time abroad that although born much later than Jung, I experienced a version of life with a religious emphasis and tensions of mind and spirit that might almost have been drafted from a blueprint of the Protestant Switzerland into which he was born.